Hello, Monetization Nation. I've seen numerous business ventures fail when they build metaphorical skyscrapers on land or platforms they don't own. This happens when a business relies too much on a platform they don't control, like Google or Facebook. And then the platform changes something major and it destroys that business. The problem with this is that the business has no control over the land or the platform on which they have built their business. John Stoddard is a partner and investor at Acquisition Partners. He was the CEO of Century Hearing Aids, which was the second largest online seller of hearing aids. He worked in business development at Intuit and was the co-founder and VP of TurboSquid. He is also the author of Pitch Deck Secrets, the underground playbook for attracting investors to your deal. In today's episode, we're going to explore how John Stoddard recovered from building a skyscraper on land he didn't own. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. So, okay, so we are going to have you start off by telling the story of Century Hearing Aids. Yeah, Century Hearing Aids. So it's, uh, it's actually came right. I was working for Intuit, and I worked for other, somebody somebody else most of my career. And then at some point, I just said, I just can't work for somebody else. I need to own my own business. And one of the fastest ways to build a business and get revenue is buy an existing business. But I was looking for a kind of a rehab business. And that's where I started. Um, I bought this company uh, for less than six figures. And it had the whole process. It had the website. Um, it had the relationship with uh, the manufacturers. And my job, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and I started building this business. It was actually very, very easy to grow it. All I did was spend more money on Google AdWords, just add more money to it. And there was a natural progression in the revenue. Uh, the cost kind of traveled along the same path. So, but what happened was um, Google decided, you know, we're going to move it all to uh, cell phones. So we're only going to have four on the top, four ads on the top and kill all the ads on the side. And I was running ads on the side about, you know, position, position six, seven or eight, something like that. Cause I knew what my costs were. If any goes higher, a uh, cost of acquisition, uh, eight in right into my gross margin. If I go any, go any lower, it just wouldn't get any sales. So I kept it right about number six, seven, eight, right around there. So as soon as Google moved to um, uh, a just, you know, a cell phone and just had three or four ads on top, the cost to acquire a customer, pay-per-click, nearly 3X to 4X is right around 3.5. Yeah, I said, oh my God, if I had, my metrics were, if I had 100 visitors coming to my website, I'd get a sale. So, and it cost me about a hundred dollars for one to acquire one customer, but that went to three to four hundred dollars. Like, I was like, I can't do it anymore, yeah. right? So, um, I had to do something different. I, I, you know, I looked at Facebook, and you can't really advertise hearing aids on Facebook because it's a handicap, it's a medical device, it's a handicap, and Facebook was really cutting down on that. So I had to figure out how to do it differently, which was inbound content marketing. Now I just say, okay, I have to answer every question there is about hearing aids, like how to read an audiogram, how to change a hearing aid battery, how to test a hearing aid battery, how to clean a tube, how to do this, how to do this. I put a hundred videos out there to just answer every question I was. And then I just started putting up on Facebook and Whichever video got the most hits on, I would just retarget, 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 and put them through the funnel. And that was the key. And then as soon as I started getting, asking people ethical bribes for testimonials from people, uh, I say, hey, if you do a testimonial for I give you a you know, box of batteries for two, three, six months, whatever it was. I, I'd get these guys, uh, you know, 75, 80 years old, and they sit there like, 
you know, like stone, like us, like these hair aids were great. I love them. And some of those would get the most views out of them, which would lead to sales. So, you know, I changed my funnel completely from a, uh, being a phone salesman and just taking the order on the lowest price from Google ads to inbound content marketing where I was the authority. And as soon as they picked up the phone, I basically just took a call. I took the order. That was a complete transformation for me because, you know, I wanted to sell the business. I was kind of tired of the business. I was tired of talking to people with hearing loss. I permanently talk loud on the phone now. <laughs> talking, I, I don't know. It just stuck with me. And any, uh, what and, you say? Yeah. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> so I, I did that. And, you know, I resemble that remark. I'm starting to, to lose my hearing a bit. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it goes, man. It goes. If you listen to too many rock concerts or anything else too loud, it it happens. Like, all the big rock stars are deaf in a way. You can't listen to 100 decibels of music that often and not damage those little tiny, the tiniest bones in your entire body. It just, it hurts them, and they just go away after a while. Anyway, when I, when I tried to sell the business, the guy looked at me and, you know, and he says, hey, there's the numbers. And he says, like, it's okay, but he asked me, how much time do you spend on the business? I said, ah, 60, 70 hours, thinking, you know, that, that'd be okay. He goes, no, you're an internet business. You should be sit, spending like 15 to 30 hours on the business. I go, are you serious? I go, yeah, you got to be able, you got to optimize your tools. You have to process in place. You got to outsource. You got to do everything. So somebody looks at your business and say, hey, I'll add that on because it's running automatically and I could buy five other businesses. So that was a great learning experience. And I spent the year not only moving to the Facebook, the new funnel and the lead source, but automating all of my systems, outsourcing chat doing everything to say, I'm going to take myself out of it. If they, if I do take a phone call, it's to pick it up and take an order if I have to do that. And I got to that point that I said, man, it was like, I'd come here and sit down and the orders would be coming in. And uh, I wasn't doing anything except, you know, just checking on stuff. And I said, I'm going to sell it. And as soon as I put it up with this broker that I work with, I got offers in 24 hours and I sold it over in three days. Congratulations. Yeah. And I, 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 that, I mean, the whole process was a great learning experience about, you know, some of the followings of, you know, don't to be dependent on one source of leads like Google, because it could be just like, you know, you and I know Russell Brunson, everything. It could be just like Thanos yep. and your lead source is gone. And it was that, I mean, I could, I, my business tanked. I mean, I had the manufacturers out here talking to them about going, hey, yeah, look, I, uh, here's my plan to get out of this. Here's my plan to turn it around. And they were all, okay, we'll give you, you know, we'll work with you on this. And they actually uh, funded me a little bit too uh, because what I did was I was selling different manufacturers and I said, uh, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to minimize down to two to three packages, good, better, best, and I'll go with you exclusive if you give me an investment and they went with that. So I put a whole bunch of different things in process right before I sold it. And, uh, uh, you know, I got to tell you this, this one story, how another reason I got out of the business and, and this is, if you're a Russell Brunson click funnels fan, you will look for anytime you look for a business to want to purchase. If you're in purchasing business, you always have to avoid a business like hearing aid business. I go, what do you mean? Well, the margins are fantastic, right? I buy a hearing aid for $135 and sell it for $7.95. That's fantastic, right? And it only cost me, after going to Facebook, maybe $75 uh, cost of acquisition. Here's the problem. There's no upsell, cross-sell, downsell. There's just one product. There's one product, yeah. So there, could you do some kind of virtual event? Um, could you do some kind of networking, you know, community or support group of people? Could you do some kind of ebook about, you know, hearing health? You know, wh what could you do? What other like information products could well, you have? 
well, I here's what here's what I did. I actually uh, it was a writing was on the wall. Uh, one of my there's a competitor that popped up, and it was high health innovations, and they were selling hearing aids at the same price, seven ninety five for one, something like fourteen ninety fourteen hundred dollars for two. And I just dug in. I thought, like, who owns high health innovations? Oh my God, it's the number one insurance company in the world. I said they can spend unlimited amounts of money to acquire a customer. And it doesn't matter. All they have to do is sell one health insurance policy, just one. And they can make up their money. They were using hearing aids as they have an upsell. Oh, that's cool. A great story to illustrate the importance of having an upsell. Yeah. I said, I've got to get out because I'll never make money on this. And I'm, I wasn't going to be licensed and acquire an insurance company or sell. You can't win if you don't have that upsell because the person with the upsell can beat you because they can outspend you on the advertising. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really good point. Okay. So talk to me about million dollar pitch deck. Tell me the story of that. Yeah. So like the, the transition, I was, I've raised some money before with TurboSquid long, long time ago. I was a part of a startup called TurboSquid, the 3D asset marketplace for 3D animators. And this is right when, this is a long time ago. This is the 90s, uh, late 90s. And, uh, you know, eBay was big. It was the old dot-com era. And we came across this idea and said, hey, we think this is a $50 million idea. Then we started raising money from Intel, Kodak, and at a local uh, venture capitalist. And we raised $5 million from there. And I wrote the marketing part to it. And it's just something that stuck with me. I kind of like doing that because it was the plan to go to market. Here's our resources. Here's what we need to do. And here's how we're going to get it done. And all of the questions around that was like, is the team capable of doing it? Well, they're already experts in their domain. They could do it. This is just something I, I develop as an expertise. And I said, I want to, I want to be able to offer this service out there. Cause it's my hope. If I help them do this, we'll do pitch decks and then we'll go help them raise money and then we'll be part of a startup. And just kind of put some packages together and I offer the million dollar pitch deck is free training going through all the necessary uh, slides in a deck, what's behind it and why they need to be in there. Meaning if you don't have that in there, you're likely to get that deck just deleted and moved on to the next. Okay. Yeah, and that's how it started. Yeah, and so what are the key takeaways from from that? What can what could you teach our audience that would help them better monetize or, or better um, better pitch their mon monetization businesses? Yeah, so if if you're raising money, you know you're going to go up in some in front of somebody that has domain expertise. You know, they've likely seen a whole bunch of other types of companies sort of like yours. Maybe a little bit different, but sort of like yours. So you're not going to show them anything new. You just need to know your numbers, you know, your market, and how you're going to get there better than anyone else. Better than anyone else. And I will tell you this right now. I don't know in any investor that's going to put money into a company on a, let's say, a high school uh, a paper, which where it's just a hypothesis. I get people, even though I have investor in my profile on LinkedIn, I get a lot of people come to me and I'll ask them, where are you at in traction? I, I, do you have an unpaid, paid pilot, you know, alpha, beta, or how many customers? 100,000, 10,000. I want to know. And what's the cost to acquire those 100 customers or cost to acquire those 10,000? Or how's that looking? Because I would rather put money into a company that, you know, I, I know it's going to cost to acquire a customer. I just need this amount of money. And we'll have this amount of customers. That's, it's not a high school hypothesis. It's a business proven business model. Nice. According to his article, and you tell me if this is accurate, um, he says that um, the, the UX changes over a period of four months improved conversion by 220%, revenue by 300%, and profits by 3,000%. Can 
Yeah, it wasn't Neil directly, but it was one of his colleagues. And, he, you know, they, he was, at, that was at the time, basically before ClickFunnels was. So, you know, they would take, uh, uh, they would just take your website and see what it's converting like. And a lot of it is gut feel to how to move, you know, a customer from this. Where do you give, where do I use the seven laws of persuasion in my website? You know, the reciprocity, you get something free to get them to like you, know you, trust you before they invest in you. Is there some discount that I got to take advantage of for being first, you know, fear of missing out? Uh, is there social proof of thousands of people liking it and there's five stars? And putting all the seven laws of persuasions right on that landing page for each area name. That's exactly what he did. And tell me what the seven laws of persuasion are. Do you know of those off the top of your head? Uh, not to the top of my head, but there's social proof, there's reciprocity, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's uh, Robert Sedani's. I've looked it up six laws of persuasion. I'm not remembering yeah. Okay. All right. So, so basically, let me restate that. So Neil and or his colleague came in. They helped you to um, redo your website. You gave away a lead magnet, something for free to get them to sign up with you. Then you could... So you were providing value and you established a relationship. Then you established the laws of persuasion showing customer reviews and testimonials. Um, and you worked on the, the conversion funnel down to, to increase your sales. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, you know, just a, a lot of it was A-B testing, sending traffic to it. And if it didn't work, you pull it out and try something else against the uh, control. Nice. Frank Hearn says, uh, your income is often directly proportional to the amount of goodwill you have in your marketplace. Yeah, that's right. Goodwill, the, the value you've provided. So the goodwill is the tangible measurement of the, I mean, as much as it can be tangible, it's the measurement of the value that you have provided. I don't know that you know, 99% all communication between each other happens on Google, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if I want to build up uh, trust in a brand, I have to send out goodwill there and, you know, create products or create, you know, they don't really care about me taking a picture of my dinner. They don't care about, uh, because it doesn't provide them value. It yeah. doesn't provide any value. It's like, I don't care. I just like, how can it help? How can it help me? Yes, that's right. He's always striving to provide value. This is the secret. Like it, it all starts with providing value. It, it turns into this credibility spiral. I provide value and then they trust me and then I sell them something small, right? But I make sure I way over deliver on the value, right? And then I nurture that relationship and I provide more value to them and I try to sell them something else, right? And just at every point in that, you know, credibility spiral, you just provide more and more value than whatever they gave you. And, and you escalate them up to where they're willing to pay you for those high-end ticket purchases. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's still a lot of other sales that have, salesy parts of that happen because you want enough of those to where you know, I have eight hours to 12 hours a day and I can only work so many clients and let's just offer $500,000. You know, let's just say I can only do it if it's 500,000 and people are making that. Russell makes it. People, if Russell can turn your funnel into a $20 million funnel, it's worth 500,000. Yeah, that's right. Or a million. I think he's charging a million now. A million bucks. But, but, okay. So here's another interesting point. Um, there's this concept of certainty and how we're willing to pay so much more for certainty. So if, if uh, let's say someone has a 90% chance that the funnels they create for us are going to be successful, you know, we may be willing to pay them 200 or 300 or $500,000, right? But let's say they have a hundred percent chance of certainty that the funnel they create for us is going to make $20 million or more. Like Russell's there. Russell's at that spot where, any funnel he creates now, I think he's batting 100%. And so you, we are often willing to pay maybe 10x as much 
for 100% certainty as compared to a 90% chance or an 85% chance, right? That, that value, that knowing if I invest in this, I, I will succeed. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that where people have been willing to pay more for a- uh, You know, there's two parts of my thoughts on this. One is there's a lot of work Russell does on the front end to make sure the market's big enough, the desire's there, and there's a great solution for it. And yep. he qualifies that before he does a funnel. He's just like, I, I know I can get results quickly and easily for this, this market. I, I talk to guys now that I'm in the uh, OTC, it's the public markets. You know, a lot of the guys say, you know, uh, they're, they've had IR firms before, or PR firms before, and they're looking for like certainty. They, they want to see if I start paying you, I'd like to see start effects. Like, well, you can't do that in the public markets. You can't guarantee the stock price is going to go up or you can't guarantee there's going to be more trading volume. You yeah. can say, here's what we're going to put in place. It's worked for here, here, and here. And you, if you've got a great solution, you've got a market, you've got a desire for it, it will happen. It's not going to happen guaranteed, but we will use our best efforts. Those, those two words are all, all you could say in, you know, I'm going to raise money for you on best efforts. Yes. What is, what is the, the best bit of advice you could share with our listeners and watchers? Oh, it's the value ladder, man. It is the value ladder. I mean, I learned, I exited a business because I knew I was going to get crushed. Because you couldn't Ex provide the value ladder. Yep. I, I couldn't provide a value ladder. I, I had no cross sell. I couldn't figure it out. Cross sell, upsell, down sell. And I come up against a competitor selling my product, my core product, but he was selling insurance policies at back end. Just think, like, he could sell, you know, unlimited amounts of those, break even, lose money, and sell one or two insurance policies gonna, because that person is going to be paying every month for the next 10 years. Yep, that's right. That's right. Huge point. And that also goes, let's talk about recurring revenue really quick. So, so the part of the reason that insurance policy is so valuable as a monetization element is because it's recurring revenue. It's not a one-time sale like a hearing aid. It is a, a product that you can get a monthly, monthly revenue stream from. Yeah. Oh, the valuations are so much higher on recurring re revenue. I mean, if you've got metrics where and somebody you know, you don't switch over insurance policies that often. You just don't switch. You don't go back to marketplace. You stick with your insurance company. And now the multiples are on up 10 to 15, I think. If people have listened to you and are interested in hearing more about this reggae marketing service that you're providing, uh, how can they reach out to you? They can go to my website at InvestorAttractionSecrets.com or they can go on LinkedIn. Look for me, John Stoddard. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here are some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, don't rely only on one source of advertising, especially when that is a source we can't control. Number two, we can recover from building skyscrapers on land we don't own by diversifying our advertising sources and moving to platforms we can control, such as gathering email addresses of potential customers. Number three, when running a business, it is important to not try to do too much of the work ourselves. Creating a business that can run without us can give us a much better entrepreneurial lifestyle and it can be much more attractive to potential buyers. Number four, just like John's competitor added an upsell insurance policy, we should strive to add in other upsell products and services. We want to make more money per sale than any of our competitors. One of the best ways to achieve this is to implement recurring revenue streams. Number five, when creating a pitch deck, it is important to know our numbers, market, and how we're going to differentiate our businesses to succeed. Investors are more likely to invest in a proven business, not a hypothesis. Number six, people are willing to pay a lot more for certainty. So how can we add more certainty to our products? One way to do this is through guarantees. Did you like today's episode? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, get a free monetization assessment of your business or subscribe to the monetization e-magazine for free at monetizationnation.com. 
You can also subscribe to the Monetization Nation YouTube channel or podcast, or you can follow Monetization Nation on Instagram and Twitter. If you enjoyed this interview and want to connect with John or his company, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile on the blog post for this episode, or you can visit his website at InvestorAttractionSecrets.com. Have you seen others recover from building a skyscraper on land they didn't own? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining us for this episode. I hope you have a fabulous day. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.